Hey everyone, welcome back to Slow Brew Finance. Today, I have a huge treat for you. We're gonna be talking to Chris Pedersen, who is the Director of Research at the Merriman Financial Education Foundation. If you've heard of Paul Merriman, you've totally heard of Chris Pedersen. I'm so honored to host him in this channel. We're gonna be talking about the two funds for life strategy he has uh, developed, and we're also gonna be talking about the best in class ETFs for 2023. I hope you enjoy. Well, thanks for wanting to do this. Um, I'm really glad. Like you're, you're my first guest, and I just I, sh I shot for the stars. You know that Paul and you were actually the the first people to talk to me about small cap value and factoring investing, um, and that was maybe a couple years ago, uh, maybe two or three years ago. And then fast forward to today, I'm just like I'm doing. I have my own channel. Um, I love studying this stuff. Um, I also study like I'm I'm studying in, through the CFA program. So I got my first two levels in. I'm gonna start my third one. It's just nice. like a it's like a passion you guys instill in me. Like it, it just made me think differently. So I thank you for your work and what you and Paul are doing. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Yeah, it's uh, you know we we love to teach. That's what we're here yeah. for. Yeah. And uh, the chance to talk to people about interesting questions and potentially spread the word is always good. Yeah. So. I know, so for me, everyone has a, a an investing journey. I started with Bitcoin <laughs> in 2017. I just gave my, my my brother money that he just evaporated into the air uh, right <laughs> at the peak of 2017 of Bitcoin. Um, and then obviously like down to today, I think about things differently, but <clears throat> this is something I always want to ask, maybe even guess in the future too. How did you start with your investing journey? Like what what did you start doing and how did you come to today and how, how did your mind shift? How did you learn? Uh, but but really interested to know how how you first started. Were you a factor investor always, or was there a time where you were flirting with other things? You know, uh, I, I think um, this is such an important question, and people come from very different backgrounds. I, I consider myself very fortunate because I was born into a a family of uh, people who were fiscally prudent and and had a long history of investing in stocks and taking prudent risks. I ha in fact, I have on my wall a set of, uh, it's a, a stock certificate from the late 1800s in the Fairview Creamery that my great grandparents bought. And uh, obviously it wasn't redeemed, so it wasn't a great investment, but, but it just goes to show that there's this long history there my grandfather taught me when I was just learning to speak to say, I am a financial wizard. <laughs> you know, this was his, his way, I think, of trying to let me know that that's an important part of your future. And I grew up in a home of people where, you know, they, we invested as a family. My parents invested in the stock market. Um, my, uh, you know, I was gifted by my grandfather some shares of AT&T when I was relatively young. Um, my, I lived with my grandmother when I was going to college, uh, my freshman year and she was, a, a stock market investor. So I learned that it was important to take prudent risks. I learned that diversification was important early on. And then when I started my career, uh, there was an employee stock purchase plan. So I, you know, I, well, I learned I learned very early in my career that I wasn't going to be part of the generation that had a pension. That went away about the time that I was getting into my career as an engineer. And so we really didn't know how much we were supposed to save. And, and we just said, well, if we maximize the stock purchase program and we maximize what we put into the 401k and we try to live on the rest, hopefully it'll work out. You know, and and in the four hundred one k, we invested in uh, primarily in um, index funds from early on. So, I uh, I think it was just the way four hundred one k's were set up. Uh, they were set up to have prudent investments that were suitable for a wide range of people, and that guided us in a good direction. Uh, we. 
then, you know, I mean, just over the years for a variety of reasons, it's like kind of like a, a rock rolling down a hill. You know, you you collect moss and you collect these different investments. And we didn't have a specific investment philosophy or portfolio plan in mind. And it wasn't until we were approaching retirement that we really started to get serious about, hey, you know, we need to know how to run our investments and live off them. And that's when I connected with Paul and uh, and started really studying portfolio allocations. Now, what we did as a result of that wasn't just switch to one of Paul's portfolios um, because I'm patient and analytical. We ran Morningstar x-rays on what we had and said, well, how does that differ from the ideal portfolio we might pick now that we've been educated? And what's the most tax efficient way to evolve what we have to become what we think it should be? And so over time, we've kind of slowly tweaked and tuned, um, but that's very different from what we teach in many respects, because what we teach is, you know, if you had a blank slate, what would you do? And so our portfolio is still kind of messy. You know, it's got a bunch of legacy stuff around, um, but we do periodically about once every two to three years, do that morning star x-ray and try to figure out, well, you know, what should we do? How should we tweak it? How should we change it to nudge it in the direction of what we want, which is something that's tilted towards small in value, broadly diversified, um, you know, hedged against any single country risk. So we've got, you know, U.S. and international. And um, so it's been, I, you know, I think most people's journeys are like that. A lot of twists and turns. Um, it, you know, it's not clean, but it's gotten us to a good place. Yeah, I wish it was cleaner. Like for me, there's always a premium that you pay when you learn. Like if you, I, I guess... Since 2016, 2017, small and value has been a horrible investment. Um, <laughs> and if if you switch back and forth between, let's say, just a pure passive index to small and value and back and forth, like there's a lot of luck uh, of how things just time themselves and you end up paying a premium if you're on the wrong side. And I feel like I've sort of been in that end <laughs> of paying a premium. <laughs> per performance <laughs> chasing is costly. Yeah, yeah, that's that's human nature that you want to buy what's hot and you know what's done well lately, and yeah, it's a very expensive thing to do. Uh, really, the uh, you know value investing is essentially a contrarian strategy, and so uh, you uh, you know the 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 words of Jack Vogel come to mind. You know, you want to buy right, hold tight, and don't peek. Those that's really the core of of a good buy and hold investor strategy. And that third piece, don't peak, is really important because if you peak and you and you uh, get emotional about what's going on, you usually will switch strategies too frequently and then you never gain the benefits of any one of them. In fact, you usually end up with a lot of the drawbacks of all of them, yeah. Yeah, and so sometimes it, it's it might not be performance chasing just when you happen to learn about things, right? Yeah, um, it, you know, it, it could be a different like for example, I know people that rode the passive wave um, in in the teens and then learned about small cap value right in the like bottom of March 2020. Investing at that time in small value would have been a great timing decision, but it's just luck in when you get to learn about these things. So it's, you know, it's just financial education is so important and just starting early is so important for that reason. Um, so one of the, probably one of the biggest things you've contributed to to Paul's work is the idea of the of the two funds for life. Um, and I, I read that book, great book. I recommend people read it. I believe it might be, you, you might have a PDF format available to investors. We do. We have a, if you sign up for the free newsletter at Paul's website, you can get the PDF for free. And, you know, this is what it looks like if you get it from Amazon. It has a lot of um, detailed graphs and stuff, which, you know, if you like to pinch zoom on a page, that works, uh, you know, on an electronic device. But if you want to write on them or do that, then then the Amazon hard copy might be good. So, yeah, but uh it's free to take a peek and uh, figure out if it's a good fit for you. So would you, would you mind explaining the two, two, two funds for life strategy? What does that look like for investors? I, I don't mind at all. I, the two fund for life strategy grew out of this idea that uh, you can, it, well, it grew out of, first of all, an idea that most people invest in a target date fund 
And uh, is there a way to improve it? And what we looked at was what does a target date fund hold? A target date fund holds uh, primarily the, the total market, U.S. and international. It's got a tilt towards the U.S., but it's U.S. and international total stock market. And then a bond allocation that increases with time, a total bond allocation. It's a great, actually, if, if most people will be extremely well served just by investing in a target date fund. It's a great solution. In fact, you run a pretty good chance of doubling your lifetime purchasing power if you set aside 10% of your income and put it into a target date fund and then take out 4% in retirement over 40 years of accumulation and 30 years of retirement. You, you double your real, that's inflation adjusted, real purchasing power. So the target date fund on its own is wonderful. It's, it's really an incredible tool. But we were wondering, is there a way to improve it? And uh, we know from academic research that the small and the value parts of the market tend to outperform the total market, admittedly with a little bit more risk. And they tend to deliver that outperformance at different times than the total market delivers its outperformance. So there's a diversification opportunity there. Those funds are broadly available. They're relatively inexpensive. And so if somebody puts some of their retirement savings into a small cap value fund, then they should have a higher expected long-term return with a modest increase in risk and it also has the advantage that they're likely to have more money in retirement to take out due to that higher return, as well as a higher safe withdrawal rate and a lower chance of running out of money at the end and a lower chance of failure. So uh, the book is really just trying to figure out, well, what percentage should you use and what's the, I, I think of it as an owner's manual for the strategy. Uh, what are all the things you would have to tolerate along the way in terms of tracking error being different, um, the kinds of drawdowns you might expect, uh, you know, all of the all of the questions somebody would come across over a lifetime of investing. And that's that's why there's a whole book. But the simplest strategy is you just take it, Let's say you're investing 10 percent in your retirement account. And that's, uh, you know, essentially 10 pennies out of every dollar you make. You take one of those pennies and you put it into small cap value and you just let that ride until you get to retirement. And when you get to retirement, you look at those and you say, well, which one's outsized? You know, I think I'm a 90 10 here, but if small cap value is bigger than the 10 percent, you take your your annual 4 percent withdrawal out of small cap value. If the target date fund is bigger than 90%, you take your 4% out of the 90% and you just do that all the way through retirement. And that's a, a pretty easy way to go and has uh, real substantial benefits to, uh, to people who would follow it. And then there are more complicated schemes too, but, but that's the gist of it. So if an investor wants to take on that strategy, what should he or she know about the strategy? What sort of education would be needed to, to implement this? Well, the, the most important thing to know is that if you want to return different from the total market, you need to have uh, the patience to tolerate returns that are different from the total market. So if you're following that strategy, uh, there is a chance that there's going to be a year when the total market is up 20% and because you have this different thing in there, you're only up 15% or 18%, you know, it'll, it'll be different. And uh, there is no way to get a better return or a different return without tolerating a different ride. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing to know is if you aren't rebalancing annually as you're accumulating, the small cap value be can become a larger part of the portfolio than 10%. It might be 20% or 30%. Now, for most people, they're going to look at that and say, well, that's not that's not bad. I got a, great, a better return. But it does mean that you're going to have more volatility than you would have had if you were only in a target date fund. Because a target date fund is a, a mix of less volatile assets. Um, the other thing is that it's going to follow a glide path. It's going to reduce your risk approaching retirement, which is going to increase your confidence in the amount of money you have going into retirement. And most people are going to see that as a good thing, but it's also going to re reduce your potential return for the money that you have in the target date fund. If you are somebody who's dramatically oversaved and can tolerate, you know, 60% ups and downs in your portfolio, you don't need 
the bonds that are in a target date fund. Um, so you may, as you approach retirement, say, you know, I have twice the money I need to retire on. I'll reduce the amount I have in the target date fund or I'll go all equity, right? I mean, some people are all equity their whole lives into retirement and they tend to be oversaved and it, it can work out if they have the ability to invest like Rip Van Winkle. You know, <laughs> you just got to look away. You can't, you can't be moved by the ups and downs of the market. So that's another thing. And target date funds do tend to be pretty conservative in retirement. They have a high bond allocation. So <clears throat> Paul has this ultimate buy and hold strategy. Uh, it's it's range, I think, like um, it might be 10 ETFs uh, in, yep. the, in the stock allocation. And um, the U.S. Director of Research have come up with a list of ETFs that you guys look at and you determine that this might be the best in class. Um, so, so when you go through the list, what criteria do you screen for when making these recommendations uh, and what makes it an ETF suitable to appear in the list? Well, the, the suitability is we're really looking for funds that are systematic. Uh, the, you know, the, the term uh, active and passive is, is loaded in a way. You know, everybody thinks, well, I want to be in a passive, broadly diversified uh, index fund, but uh, you can have a fund that is managed in the same systematic way that a passive fund is managed, but it doesn't publicly disclose its methodology or when it's going to trade. Uh, is that worse because it's called an active fund? Um, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, there are actually advantages to having a fund that hides when it's going to trade because it can't be front run. Uh, there are a number of passive funds that actually lose about a percentage point per year in return because they're very public about how they're going to trade and people front run those trades. And when they trade, they have to pay a premium to buy the new stocks that they're going to buy into and sell the old stocks that they were getting out of. So I don't actually care whether it's labeled passive or active, but what I do care is that when I look at the history of the fund, I can explain its performance by how much exposure it gave me to these attributes or parts of the market that academics say are gonna give me a higher return. So if I, uh, and the way we do that is we use a portfolio visualizer to look at the factor exposure history um, using regression analysis. And you can actually download all that data from portfolio visualizer yourself. So when you do that, um, you get two things, you get one, the amount of exposure you get to these different attributes, how you know how much of the returns were driven by small versus large, value versus growth, um, highly profitable companies versus less profitable companies, et cetera. Um, and you also get a number that tells you, well, how good's the model? Like when I look back, does it explain 99% of the performance of the fund or 95%? And we look for funds where it's about 99% plus explanatory value. And what that tells me is there's, there's no magic Wizard of Oz behind the screen who's second guessing the market and doing goofy market timing and stuff. They really are managing the fund as if it's a passive fund. And they're doing it systematically and, and using a methodology that is consistent and I can count on in the future. So, so once we've kind of filtered on that, and we know we've got these funds that are being managed in a systematic way, we're basically looking for is the, is the expected return of that fund for the category that it's in going to, uh, and this is after expenses, is, is it the best that I can get? So out of the small cap value funds, if I look at the amount of exposure that gives me to small and to value, and to profitability, um, when I add up the historical expected returns for those attributes times the amount of exposure that I get for each of those and subtract out the expense ratio, is that the best one I can find? So it's, it's a spreadsheet exercise, it's analytical, it's divorced of emotion, and uh, it's objective. And those are qualities that I thought were really important in our selection process. Um, there is one final piece that overlays on it, and that's there is a little bit of attention given to the, the label of the fund. So if I'm looking for a small cap value fund and the best one this year is labeled 
something that has nothing to do with small cap value, that's a red flag that it probably has something to do with the methodology of the fund not being a fit. And so, so that gets consideration as well as a number of other secondary factors, like how many stocks are in the fund. You know, we'd like something broadly diversified. What's the total expense ratio of the fund? We don't want something that's wildly, you know, out of, uh, out of, out of reason. So uh, that all leads us to uh, the choices and um, it's, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> it takes a lot of time because I got to do that for each and every one of the 10 categories that we choose. Yeah. So I know um, Avant is, you know, it's this huge ETF provider that came out in the last uh, three, four years. Um, and they've amassed a huge amount of AUM. Uh, but there's the DFA, which uh, for a long time, they were advisor only. You could only access through advisors. And all of a sudden, I think, I believe 2021, they came out with their ETF lineup. Um, and I don't know, in a, in a lot of communities, I always see this like DFA versus Avantis uh, kind of, not clash, but there's definitely some competition. And uh, some people have even said that DFA came out with the ETFs after Avantis came out because they saw that some of the market share might have been gone if they weren't going to go into the ETF space. And when I look at the best in class, I see a lot of Avantis and not a lot of DFA, which is interesting and, and valid. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to hear about why Avantis and versus DFA. Not that there's, you know, a, the a right answer, but I just kind of wanted to hear about the process of selecting Avantis. Yeah. I, I, I... Um, yeah, and I still don't know if it's Avantis or Avantis. I would say Avantis, but <clears throat> um, Avantis grew out of DFA not offering ETFs. Uh, so they were a lot of the employees that were initially at Avantis came from DFA, and they uh, they would say they updated the methodology that they learned at DFA based on new academic information and put a little more emphasis on profitability as a third factor in addition to size and value to create ETFs that, in their opinion, are better than DFA. I, I don't take their word for it. Uh, we run the analysis. This year, we did add, uh, I think the International Value Fund uh, was... Uh, we used to use one that wasn't DFA or Avantis, and it's now been replaced with one that's DFA. So uh, they're, they get consideration. There are two. The, the number one reason why Avantis still has more funds recommended is that when I run through that analytical process, they still have a higher predicted factor return after expenses than the DFA funds that are available as alternatives in the categories where Avantis is still chosen. But we do list the DFA funds as good second choices because we know that sometimes people have limited selection and say a 401k and if they have access to the DFA funds, they're great choices. And you know, something else to say here is that I have to, I have to choose one to be best but that doesn't mean the differences to number two, three, four, five, six are all that great. Sometimes the differences are very small. Um, and I think DFA ver versus Avantis is one of those cases where most of the time I would expect the difference over the long term not to be that great because they come out of the same uh, academic kind of principle of how they construct their funds. And um, I, I would expect them both to be good choices. Yeah. So small value is a, a great, great asset class to be in. There, there's some research that suggests that small may not even be a factor. Uh, there's some correlation between value stocks and small stocks. Just by the very nature, small stocks are going to be tend to be overlooked. There's probably some, uh, you know, you could say that uh, they're overlooked. Therefore, they will lie and tend to be more value focused. So... Um, I kind of lie in that camp nowadays. I feel like uh, it just makes sense that the value factor just tends to cluster in the the small factor. But you know, even when you think of factor investing um, and you look at like the French Fama uh, five factor model, you see that large companies um, tend to be less risky, right? Um, but then you see something like quality, where you 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 say that you know a quality company could be riskier. 
because uh, if, if there were two stocks, for example, one had good quality and the other one didn't have good quality, you know, it, it all comes down to value, uh, which one's being discounted more. So it doesn't make sense to me that large is the same thing. It seems to me like if, if, if a large company is a value company, there might be more risk than, than a smaller company because you know, if, if, this, if, if this company is being discounted more, even though it's large, then that doesn't compute. What, what, how do you think about uh, small exposure? Because I know within the best in class, uh, there is a small blend, which is not you know, directly small growth, which we know is, uh, tends to be a, a bad asset class to be in. But um, why, why include small blend in there if we know that, uh, that small growth you know, has bad returns and we know that, you know, value, whether it's smaller or large, uh, you know, all that matters is just kind of the, the discount factor used in the value factor more than the, than the uh, size factor. Um, I just threw a lot there, but uh, what, what are your thoughts uh, regarding the, the, the size factor? Well, it is, it actually has one of the smaller expected returns historically. Uh, so it doesn't, play that much into the selection process we do for the best in class funds. Uh, but there's, uh, if you look at the, the, actually I can pull it up in my book here. If you look at the nine by nine or the three by three grid of all of the returns in the U S market. Yeah, it's right here. Um, you were just kind of talking about this. So this is on page 44 of my book. So I'll just kind of pull it up. Yeah, so people can probably take a peek at that on the video. I'll, I'll um, include a screenshot in there too. Yeah, okay. Um, it, well, and you can pull it out of the PDF if you want it nice yep. and square and everything. The uh, the like the worst box to be in is small growth, and you just kind of mentioned that. So so this is just looking back historically, and what the academics did was they they said, you know, we don't know why, we just think maybe there's a difference in these returns historically. So that's the worst box to be in because it has the worst drawdown and and uh, 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 the lowest return of all of the boxes. It's only lower by a little bit than, say, large blend, but return per unit of risk, it's the worst box to be in, uh, where the small value is the best box to be in. And so you can you can just approach it that way and you can say, well, okay, the strongest sauce on this page to differentiate a portfolio of an S&P 500 is small value. It's gonna give me the greatest bump in return and it does it with you know, a relatively modest increase in risk. Uh, but there's a second piece to that and that's, yeah, but does it have? Is there any explanation for why that might not just be random? And uh, I, to me, the places I go that feel comfortable are number one that small companies have more room to grow, uh, more room to be agile. Um, they uh, they will be riskier, but they they have more room to grow. Uh, as you point out, they have room to be under the radar and be underappreciated. And then number two, the small growth companies tend to be high flying startups where the hype is getting people super excited long before there's profitability. And they are a great opportunity to pay too much for a dream that is never realized. And so I, th I think there are behavioral and risk reasons why uh, it, it's reasonable to believe that small cap value in the long term should do okay. There's also the fact that small cap value can underperform for very long periods of time. And in a sense, that's a behavioral game of chicken, right? So the return is going to go to the person who has the best behavior. That premium is going to show up for the people who stayed the course, not for the people who performance chased and bailed at five years or four years or eight years or 10 years. And so I think uh, all of that argues in favor of a small allocation in your portfolio being made to small cap value because uh, it is going to potentially give you this higher return. And, and, uh, and I, ag I agree with you, the, the small factor on its own, because you have this, this square over there <laughs> that does really badly and one that does really well, you can say, well, small by itself isn't great. And that's part of the reason why, even when we look for our small cap blend, we look for a small cap blend portfolio or fund that avoids small cap growth and looks for profitability as a screen because that means you're you're avoiding that bottom right hand box.
So would you say that including small blend then is just to to recommend that like let, let's say in the in the ultimate buy and hold is part of it just to for behavioral reasons so that people just have exposure to international small U.S. small and um, you know there's always that risk of when when small growth does well uh, in the future you know there's always going to be that risk that people look at their portfolio and notice that it's not there right is that kind of the reason why uh, it's included in the ultimate buy and hold. I think it's uh, actually if you go to some of the work that Daryl Balls has done with the quilt charts and you look at uh, a 10 fund solution versus a four fund solution versus a uh, a two fund solution, what you find is that the more funds you have, the more likely it is you're in the middle of the returns, the less dispersion of, of return ranking you have over the years. So the more funds you have, the the more predictable the performance is going to be over time so you can you can say well is that is that just a behavioral crutch uh because you'd get a greater return if you had more constant a more concentrated portfolio uh if i was to recommend the portfolio that has the highest return per unit of risk it would be a barbell it'd be a larry swedrow small cap value plus bonds it has the highest return per unit of risk uh, it has the lowest volatility for the Kager you're going to get, basically. But there's almost no one other than Larry that can actually live with that, right? Because because you're totally different from everybody else. Uh, and you have to trust a tremendous amount of academic research to buy into it. Uh, I think a lot of people who buy into a 10-fund portfolio like it, as you point out, for behavioral reasons, you always own what you always own what's hot. When somebody says, you know, oh, this was a fantastic year for large cap value, you've got it. You know, this was a fantastic year for REITs, you've got it. This was a fantastic year for, uh, year for emerging markets, you've got it. And so there's just no regret avoidance or, or, or there is regret avoidance. You're, you're avoiding regretting not having what's hot. Yeah, tracking error is such a... <laughs> It's a hard subject, honestly. It's a uh, looking different is uh, almost unacceptable to most investors, and so uh, it's always it's always a good idea to take that into consideration when constructing a portfolio. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> moving on to uh, geography and diversification, um, is is geographical diversification a matter of diversifying country specific risk? So, so one of the things I think about is. Um, international uh, stocks right now are very attractive in, in, in terms of valuation, but you can make the, you know, the case that, well, that's just, it's just value investing at that point. What, how do you think about uh, international diversification? Um, do you give any idea uh, or any credence to the idea that you should invest in low cape countries, for example, where if a, if a country is doing really badly and, and you know, has the cyclically adjusted PE that you should invest in it, or, or is it just, a, just a, a mere fact of diversifying and eliminating country-specific risk, meaning you know, being 100% in the U.S., it's still, it, it, there's this sort of risk that is not diversified, therefore you should not be compensated for it. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? I, you mentioned early on in that, question is international diversification primarily avoiding the idiosyncratic risk of a single country failure i i believe that's the fundamental reason to internationally diversify uh, it and uh, people will come back and say oh yeah but the u.s is not like any of these other countries that have failed uh, and to that i would I would counter two things. Number one, if you went back 120 years, nobody would have predicted the U.S. to be the powerhouse that it is in financial circles today. Uh, we were just, you know, one of many countries. Uh, we didn't hold a special place in the universe. And so is that because of, you know, some something systematic in how we do things in the U.S.? Or was it a lucky 120 years? You know, you, you, you don't know. And the other piece is if, if you went back to, uh, say, the 1970s with Japan and said you're going to have 40 years plus of zero market return on your stock market investments, would anybody have bought that? Nobody would have. Japan was super hot. They were, you know, 
half the global uh, market cap at the time. So it, you can't see it coming. You can't see the idiosyncratic risk of a single country failing or running on to running into really, really bad times in advance. It's, it's only in retrospect that you see it. And if you assume that the U.S. is like other countries and you look back over 100 years and say, you know, when, you know, what percentage of countries went through one of these catastrophic failures, you'd say over over a lifetime, it's about 5 percent. That's that's what I say in my book. So, you know, are you comfortable with a five with having your entire portfolio in a single country where maybe your lifetime risk is we'll even divide it by two because you believe in the U.S. two percent. Right. I think most people would be uncomfortable with the idea that there's a two percent chance that that their whole portfolio is going to fail for some reason. And so I think the fundamental argument in favor of having something internationally is against that single country idiosyncratic risk. Now, does it make sense to cycle between countries based on when they're cheap? You know, you mentioned the CAPE ratio. I think uh in this regard, I'm more of an efficient market hypothesis kind of person. I think countries get cheap for a reason. Now, sometimes popularity is that reason. And there are periods of time when the efficient market hypothesis that you know everything's fairly priced does get out of whack. I don't know how to detect those. I, you know, I don't know how to tell when a, a country is cheap because of unreasoned emotion versus reasoned uh, you know, calculus. And the U.S. market tends to be expensive because we have good property rights. You know, we protect people. We have good regulatory environments. You know, you could debate that with the banks right now, but in general, compared to a lot of third world countries. And so people pay a premium. We're also cheap and efficient. You know, it's relatively inexpensive to buy funds here. And you can you can get very broad diversification almost for free. So there's a reason why the U.S. market is more expensive. I, so I, I, I tend not to buy into the idea that uh, geographical you know, cycling of your portfolio based on CAPE makes sense. Plus, it's just complicated. I think most people will do better following those, you know, those simple words of Jack Bogle, buy right, hold tight, don't peak. Because if you're if you're trying to do that kind of cycling, you got to look, you, you have to be peaking. Yeah. I think, uh, I happened to be in an ETF that was heavily invested in Russia last year, uh, the very beginning of the year that did not play out too well. And, and Russia was, you know, single digit PE, very low. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, like you said, those, um, those countries are cheap for a reason. Yep. There's a very, there's a credible risk that, you know, those countries can go to zero. Uh, and they yeah. have in the past. So ha moving on to um, this like little portion of, of, of factor investing that makes some people uncomfortable and that's momentum, the momentum factor. Um, I haven't found a, a reason for it to work under an efficient market hypothesis sort of framework. It seems to me that every other, you know, the French Fama five factor model, everything kind of fits in if you look at it within a, an efficient market hypothesis framework. But momentum, you know, Eugene Fama said it, it's the premier anomaly. Um, and so the, the thing I would say to that, it's like a, a consistent anomaly doesn't sound like an anomaly to me if it's persistent, right? Um, and maybe it works in the future, maybe it just disappears. But what do you make of the momentum factor? Is there a, a risk premium to it? Is it just behavioral and should it be targeted? Can it be targeted directly by uh, selecting stocks that have done well in the past? There is a risk premium to it, as you point out, academically, you know, it's stood the test of time. You can go back and study it for a long period of time and see that it has uh, delivered a premium when people have filtered on high momentum stocks, uh, upward momentum stocks and filtered out downward momentum stocks. Uh, the explanation that fits best for me and kind of ties back to this, you know, why, you know, why doesn't it fit the efficient market hypothesis is that humans invest in the stock market, not machines. And humans tend to uh, have a lot, there's a lot of behavioral biases that uh, we like what's been doing well recently. We believe that what's been doing well recently is is likely to continue to. 
we have uh, the endowment effect going on where we hate to let go of things that we have owned. So when they have been doing well, uh, and they start to not do well, we tend to hold on to them. So there's a bunch of there's a bunch of human biases that I think contribute to it. The problem I have with it, there are t- two problems, but the number one problem is that it's not very efficient because you have to trade frequently. You have to trade when uh, momentum changes. And so momentum funds tend to have high turnover. And there have been studies done that show that at an institutional level, you can still achieve a significant part of the premium. But at a retail level, there are very few funds that after trading expenses deliver a high percentage of the premium. You have to derate it a lot. Uh, So even though it's a very high premium, you're only going to get a small percentage of it. And there are very few funds that offer it. And so because of those things, the inefficiency and the lack of selection, we don't make it a strong part of our uh, our strategy or make it a you know a, a screen on the strategy it goes into the regression calculations so funds that have high negative uh, momentum get filtered out or funds with high positive momentum get a little bit of a boost from it but um, yeah it's it's hard for a retail investor to get anywhere near what the academics would tell you you should be able to do you know this is a kind of like a tangent line but um, do you do you know if Avant is, um implements some sort of momentum screen when it comes to rebalancing? To me, it seems like a uh, just a good idea if if a if a stock is going it it's undergoing momentum instead of rebalancing right away, just letting it run. Do you know if that's part of Avant is of what they do or off the top of my head, I'd have to go back and I'd have to go back and check. I don't remember for sure. I think they do, but yeah, yeah. So my most watched video in this channel has been uh, a review on on the a- AVGE, which is the uh, Avantis Global Equity. It's a great little ETF, right? Uh, yep. When I, I was super excited when it came out because it's just kind of like uh, it's it's factor tilted, but it doesn't have the tracking error that that a, a focused value fund would. Um, what are your thoughts on the fund? Um, what sort of investor do you see could benefit from having exposure to it? And and what do you think it could fit in a, in a portfolio? Uh, it reminds me in some ways of the, the Vanguard multi-factor fund it, because it's, it's kind of, it's an all in one, you know, you're trying to toss a bunch of things into a single bucket. And in that sense, it's trying to be a portfolio. It's not uh it's not a component to build a portfolio out of so much as it is a portfolio in a single fund. So for an investor who wants a very small number of funds and they don't want to think deeply about or, or have a lot of control over how much they have of the different attributes within a fund, I think it's great. I I think it's a, it's, it's a very convenient offering, just like the Vanguard multi-factor fund, very convenient offering. Um, the problem we have with it is that it doesn't fit into the a la carte strategies that we kind of put together. And it's also not as, it's not going to be as value or as small as a portfolio, as our portfolios would be because it tilts, but it, it doesn't tilt as far as a 50, 50 fund does, you know, where you've got 50% in value and 50% in small and 50% in large and 50% in blend. Uh, it, it tilts, but not as far. So I think the expected return's a little bit lower, but it's going to be a higher expected return over the long haul than a target date fund because a target date fund is total market hedged with bonds. And that's going to be a little safer, a little less volatile, but lower expected return. I don't know if you saw the news this week, but uh, Avant is coming out with six new ETFs. And one of them, I think it's AVGV. It's like an AVGE, but it's only value focused. So that should be a, an interesting one to look at. Uh, I think there's another one. I don't remember the ticker. It might, I might be wrong. It's like AVMG or something. I don't know. But uh, th- that is a balance fund. I think it's a, it's a third in bonds uh, and then a third AVGE. Uh, two thirds, I mean, AVGE. So that should be interesting to look at. I, I kind of like how they're going into fund of funds because to me, like you were talking about conven- being convenient. Um, 
to me, simplicity is super important for retail investors. Uh, if you could just give a couple tickers, and and that's kind of what you you get at with the two funds for life. Um, there's lots to be gained from that simplicity. Um, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, I know Paul is a secret market timer. Uh, he does it for his for, for part of his portfolio. Now he doesn't really promote it. Uh, or doesn't really recommend it to anyone uh, due to behavioral errors. And you know, the thing with market timing, it's, it's not there to make you money over the long term, but it, it is a sort of tool that you have in order to reduce drawdown risk. Um, what are your personal thoughts on market timing? Is this an area where you and Paul differ or do you think the idea has any sort of merit? Well, first, I, w I wouldn't describe Paul as a closet market timer. He's really open about it. You know, he, t he talks about his portfolio and his old firm implementing this market timing strategy. So he's, he's very open about it, but he's also very open about not doing it himself and that he thinks it would be impossible for most people to do it themselves. So since we are advising DIY investors, that's why it's it's not something we recommend. Uh, there's just, I think I think it's something like uh, 70 or 80 percent of the trades you make are on the losing side, right? You know, that you, you're getting out and you're getting in, you're getting out and you're getting in. And, and most of the time it's not helping you. But once in a while, it helps you a lot. So behaviorally, it's really easy to want to change the methodology while you're using it. And that's a recipe for disaster uh, or to skip trades that come up another recipe for disaster. So it just doesn't fit a DIY investor. And unfortunately, the solution Paul uses at his firm is only available to customers who use that firm. So it's not like we can point you at a fund and say, you know, oh, here, go use Paul's market timing for half your portfolio. If we could, a lot of people would probably do it because, you know, they really respect Paul. Now, Paul is, by his own admission, a nervous Nelly. You know, he he is always thinking about the negative and the downside. And for him, this gives him, when you look at the portfolio as a whole, reduced volatility versus what he would have to tolerate if he were just a buy and hold investor. Because on the downside, when the market's down and dirty and you know it's dropping like a rock for months at a time, he's got a part of his portfolio that pulls out and sits on the side in cash. Uh, so for him, uh, you know, that's where his comfort zone is. And everybody's different. Uh, some people don't need that. Uh, I don't feel like I need it personally. We try to train our buy and hold investors to understand the amount of volatility they're going to have to tolerate given the fixed income equity allocation that they've chosen. And if they choose that right, then they don't need it either. They don't need that extra insurance on the side. So it's just, it's a really tough thing to do or to buy in the retail market. And uh, that's, that's why it's not part of the recommendation set. Yeah. Well, just coming to an end here, um, where could people go to find your content? Uh, is there anything new or exciting that's happening uh, with uh, the, the foundation? Uh, anything you want to share with viewers? Well, you can find all of our work at www.paulmerriman.com. I answer questions on a pretty regular basis in our free newsletter. If you sign up for the free, free newsletter at the website, you can get a free copy of Paul's book, We're Talking Millions, which is a great introduction to a lot of our principles and what we teach about investing. You can also get a free PDF of my book, uh, Two Funds for Life, which is a deep dive owner's manual into the Two Fund for Life strategy. And in terms of, well, and we do pod, podcasts pretty much every week. I'm on there about once a month. Probably the biggest thing we're trying to pull off this year, which I think is uh, going to be interesting, is more of a deep dive on how people should select their own glide path. If they're not going to follow a target date fund or a two fund for life strategy, how can they adjust their bond equity allocation over time? And what should they expect from that? And that's that's a an exciting new area of research for us. So this should be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing to seeing the research when it comes out. Chris, thank you so much for for the opportunity and uh, have a good day. <laughs> thank you, Jose. Take care.